It is my privilege to be here and my pleasure to be here with you this morning to open God's Word. We are going to be again this morning in the little book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Now, if you are new to Scripture or just learning your Bible, uh, Ruth is a little book that you might miss in the Old Testament if you're not careful. We start out with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and then comes Ruth. And right after Ruth comes 1 Samuel. So if you find Judges and you skip over to 1 Samuel, you just went by it. We're going to be in the second chapter and we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 23 this morning. First thing we're going to do is finish up a little something that we... Uh, you know, it's hard to, to, to set up a, a, a to-be-continued-later sermon in Scripture when we all know how it ends anyway, okay? But I tried to do that a little bit last week. So we're going to finish that up, and then we're going to move on to a little bit different point, but they're very related, and I hope to be able to show that to you this morning. So as we go through this morning, I want you to think overall in regard to how you go about making decisions in your life. You recall last week we talked about the fact that Ruth ended up in Boaz's field as not being something that merely happened by chance, that this was something that was guided by God's hand. And how each of us, as we make decisions on a daily basis, can be guided by God's hand, but it requires for us to think from a Christian framework. The, the term that's thrown about uh, in a lot of places is a term called world view. That the way we view the world impacts how we make decisions. Um, if we have a Christ-centered world view, it will impact how we think about music, art, biology, physics, history, um, as well as spiritual matters. If we have a worldview that's not based on Christ, it will affect how we look at things in a similar manner, only it won't be Christ-centered. And we talked about last week how Ruth had, in the first chapter, if you will recall, had turned to Naomi and said, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to reject my idols, I'm going to reject my gods, I'm going to reject my country, I'm going to go where you go, do what you do. I want to have your God as my God. And how Ruth was working from, while it wasn't a Christ-centered worldview, obviously because Christ hadn't come, it was a God-centered worldview. And how that influences everything that we do, whether we realize it or not. And how sometimes seemingly innocent, unimportant decisions can be the fulcrum upon which our life balances for some times. Sometimes little seemingly innocent decisions turn out to have repercussions that echo for a long, long time, not only in our lives but in others. We're also going to talk this morning about the beginning of redemption, how this... Uh, this time with Boaz and this experience that Ruth has pictures and mirrors our own redemption if we've placed our faith and trust in Christ, how this is a foreshadowing of it. So as we go through this this morning, I want to ask you to allow your heart to be open to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Listen to that still small voice that may come upon you as we read through this and listen to the Holy Spirit as we go. I'm going to be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Translation, chapter 2, the book of Ruth, starting in verse 8, and it goes like this. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field and don't leave this one, but stay here close to my female servants. See which field they are harvesting and follow them. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you when you are thirsty? Go and drink from the jars the young men have filled. Now, we talked about last week, if you'll recall, how Boaz suddenly found himself facing a rather big decision. Last week, if you will recall, Boaz noticed this new young woman in his field 
And it's not clear for what reason that Boaz noticed her. You see, Ruth's name means beauty with charisma. But I want you to notice, and I'll just tell you, if you read the whole book, not once is Ruth commended for her exterior beauty, but on a number of occasions we learn about the nobleness and strength of Ruth's character. It very well may be that this strength of character is what attracted Boaz to her to begin with, you see, because he noticed her and turned to his chief steward, and his chief steward told him a number of things. First of all, that she was polite enough to ask to come into the field to glean. She did not have to do that. Under the Mosaic law, it was her right to go into someone's field and glean during the harvest time. But yet her character was such that she was going to be respectful of the man who owned the field and the servants there and ask if she could have permission to do that. Secondly, the chief steward pointed out, not only that, she's been out there working since sunup and has only taken a short break. So Boaz, seeing her, and we're not sure why he noticed her other than the fact that she may have been new, what he hears about her is that she is a young woman of strength, of character, and noble character. That's what he hears first. He also knows, as we find out later on, he knows who she is. He knows that she came from Moab. We know that that's been reported to him, as we'll see later on. But also from last week, the chief steward said, this is the Moabite woman that came with Naomi when she returned from Moab. So he knows a number of things about her, but knowing that she is from Moab instantly puts him on, as they say, the horns of a dilemma. You see, he knows that as the owner of a field, as a man of means that it is his obligation to allow her to glean from his field. But he also knows, according to God's law in Deuteronomy, because she's from Moab, he is not to have anything to do with her. <clears throat> there is a provision in the law that says even to the tenth generation, even to the tenth generation, someone from Moab is not to have any dealings with someone from Israel. It even goes to the point of saying that he is not to do anything that would assist her, help her out, make her life easier or better. So his dilemma is this. On the one hand, there's the law that says I'm to allow her to glean. On the other hand, there's the law that says I cannot allow someone from Moab to benefit from anything that I do. I cannot do anything to allow her to better herself. So Boaz at this point has to make a decision. And we can tell by his words that he has made that decision. Now, we have the same scripture to look at that Boaz did. We have the same understanding of the law as Boaz did. So let's look for a minute and try to understand how Boaz worked through these seeming contradictions in the law. First of all, let's look at the law that says you can't do anything to help anybody from Moab. What do we know about the people from Moab? Well, the main thing we know about them is they were not the nation of Israel. Well, what does that mean? That means they did not have the benefit of God's blessing. They did not have the benefit of God's law. They were not people of the law. They were condemned people. Okay? Now, if you're condemned, you can't get much more condemned than that. You notice in today's legal system, somebody might get five life sentences, but they're only sentenced to death how many times? Well, that's as far as you can go, okay? Moab was outside the law. They couldn't go any farther outside the law than that. So why does this law appear that, Israel, you're not to have anything to do with people from Moab? Well, you ever tell your kids not to touch a hot stove? You do, don't you? Why, why do you tell your kids not to touch a hot stove? Well, because it'll burn them. And they're not old enough to what? Know the difference. Is it possible that God put this law in the place for Moab, in place for the people of Moab, more to protect the nation of Israel than it had to do with punishing the nation of Moab? They were acting like people from Moab act. And the nation of Israel camps next to them, and rather than act the way the people of the law should act, what did they do? 
They went and worshipped their gods. They lived with their temple prostitutes. They just totally lost it. They were immature. They were not capable of being a witness to Jehovah God. So God says, okay, if you're not mature enough to do this, then we're going to put a prohibition in place, not so much for the people of Moab, but for you people of Israel, because you're not old enough to deal with it. Any of you ever see the Night at the Museum movies? You remember the part there where Larry Daly and the little little uh, monkey in the first one get into a slapping contest? Do you remember that? They, they, one slaps, and then the other slaps, the other slaps. And, and who comes up? Teddy Roosevelt, right? And what does Teddy Roosevelt say to Larry Daly? Who has evolved? Who has evolved? In other words, Larry Daly shouldn't be slapping a monkey. Larry Daly should know better. This is God saying to the nation of Israel, don't hang out with the people of Moab. You should know better than this. So we're going to put a prohibition on them. Boaz understands this. He understands what this is. He looks at the other part of the law that is right next to the piece of the law that Jesus quotes that says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Larry Daly looks at this and he looks at Ruth and he says, hmm, here's what I know about her. She's abandoned her gods. She's abandoned her country. She says that she wants to make Naomi's God her God. And here she is in my field. This is almost a no-brainer. You see, Boaz understood the greater matter of the law. And you see, in our decisions, in our life, we need to understand the greater matter of the law when it comes to reaching other people and talking to other people about Jesus Christ. Boaz is not saying, Oh, Ruth, you can come and when we go to worship on Sunday, you come and sit with us, but you go ahead and worship your Moabite gods and we'll worship Yahweh. No, he knows that's not what's going to happen. He knows the greater matter of the law is to love his neighbor to love the sojourner, to love the widow, to love those less well off than him. You see, we have the advantage of Jesus' teaching. In Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, you will recall during that time frame, were the ones that, that took molehills and made mountains out of them and ignored the mountains. How do we know this? This verse, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin. <clears throat> in other words, he's saying, you guys even tithe on the spices in your cabinets. You tithe on the stuff you bake with, okay? You've got this tithing thing down. And yet, and yet, you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others in other words he's not condemning them for their tithing he's just saying you missed the total point you're majoring on the minors you have not been able to discern the greater matter of the law Boaz discerned the greater matter of the law and look at what he does he expresses mercy to Ruth and he expresses grace to her he says come Stay in my field. You, you, you work with my, my women servants. When, when you get thirsty, you, you drink from them. And, and when you get hungry, you eat with them. And you stay under my protection. He's welcomed her in under his protection. You see, and so we see there, we see the coming together finally of Boaz's understanding of the law and the greater matter of the law. And you see coming into it Ruth's faith and Ruth and Naomi's need. It's all coming together into a beautiful story. And Ruth is standing there knowing she has the right to be in that field. But even understanding that right, here's this man inviting her to eat and to drink and to be protected. Remember at one point he says, have I not told my young men to stay away from you? This was a time when everybody did as their own heart told them to. But he's bringing her under his complete protection. And I want you to listen as we read this. Next, it's kind of a long passage, but I want you to listen to this. See if you can pick out something you've heard already this morning, okay? Not in my sermon, but in one of the songs that was sung. 
Now this is Ruth. This is after Ruth hears Boaz say, you're under my protection. You stay, you eat, you stay with my people. She fell face down. She bowed to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor with you so that you notice me, although I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, Everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. How you left your father and your mother and your native land and how you came to a people you didn't previously know. May the Lord reward you for what you've done. And may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. My Lord, she said, I have found favor with you, for you have comforted and encouraged your servant, although I'm not like one of your female servants. At mealtime, Boaz told her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the vinegar sauce. So she sat down beside the harvesters, and he offered her roasted grain, and she ate and was satisfied and had some left over. And when she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her even gather grain among the bundles. And don't humiliate her. Pull some stalks out from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. And don't rebuke her. So Ruth gathered grain in the field until evening. She beat out what she had gathered and it was about 26 quarts of barley. She picked up the grain and went into the town where her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She brought out what she had left over from her meal and gave it to her. Now guys, this this is one of the key, key points in the whole book of Ruth. And what Ruth says is a question. This question that she asks is a question that every one of us, I hope, has had the opportunity to ask. And if we never have, maybe you can ask this question this morning. When you look at the great and magnificent and wonderful God in heaven that we serve, The God of the universe that spoke everything that there is into being and holds everything together by His Word. When we contemplate that magnificence and then we think about our own sinfulness. And then we look at Jesus on the cross. We ask this question that Ruth asked. Why have I found favor with you so that you notice me? even though I'm a foreigner. You see, we serve a God that loved us so much that even though we are separated from Him by our sin, even though we are a foreigner as far as He is concerned, even though He is as great as He is and we are as weak as we are, He sent His Son to die on a cross on our behalf. And who are we that He would do that for us? Remember the song the choir sang, Who am I? Who am I that you would love me, God, that that in the spite of my sin, that you would love me? Well, that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we love. This is what you begin to see in this little picture of Boaz and Ruth. Here's, Here's Ruth. She says, Who am I, Boaz, that you would not only let me into your field, but you you give me something to eat. You you, you protect me. You, you take me, you take me uh, as one of your own. Who am I that you would do this? And we ask that same question. Just as Ruth was invited by Boaz, invited in, so we are invited in to his protection. Boaz said, drink from the jars. We're, we're invited to drink from a well that will never run dry. We're invited... To, to live with a Savior that could have stayed in heaven, but instead He came down and shed His blood for each one of us. If you've never in your life been to a point to ask that question, please, please consider it this morning. If you've never, ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, it's not hard. You just say, Jesus, save me from my sins. And he's faithful and just and he will do that. And you can ask that question, who am I? And the answer is a wonderful answer. It's a God of heaven that loves each one of us. You see, this interaction continues. Like I say, he invites her in. Uh, and then he, it tells her in so many words that it's because of her faith. He said, the Lord reward you. 
because you've been faithful to Naomi. You've been faithful to your God. You are, you are faithful. And what does God tell us? Ephesians 2.8 For you're saved by grace through what? Faith. And this is not from yourself. It is God's gift. God gifts us this faith and we exercise it. He gifted Ruth. Ruth showed faith to Naomi. She said, I'm, I'm going to give up my gods. I'm going to give up my idols. I'm going to give up my land. Give up my people to, to, to be yours, God. And God rewarded her with this whole thing, this whole thing that is not happenstance, these decisions that were guided by His hand. you know. Uh, and this grace continues just like for us. The grace that we enjoy as being a part of God's family continues day after day. He tells, uh, he, he tells her, come and eat with us. Someday we will eat with Jesus at the, bri- at, the, at the feast of the bridegroom. In heaven there will be this great feast and we're invited to be a part of that. He tells his harvesters to let her glean from the bundles already harvested. To, to, to tie them loose and let some of it kind of fall out on the ground so that she can have this grace and have an abundance of grain for her and Naomi. Just as we have an abundance of grace for our daily living if we would just trust Jesus for it. Um, you know, he tells, he tells the young man two different times. He says, don't humiliate her and don't rebuke her. And you say, well, why is that in there? Well, just imagine that you're Ruth and Boaz has given you this great boon of being able to become a part of him. He, he's redeeming you. He's pulling you out of your, 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 your destitute condition. And, and he's making it easy for you. Remember what we said about Ruth's character? What kind of character is she? Noble character, good character. Don't you think she noticed how gracious Boaz was being? Don't you think she saw those guys pulling those bundles out? Don't you think she knew what Boaz was doing? And he's saying, if she calls that to your attention, don't you make fun of her. Don't you make her feel bad about the fact we're giving her a little bit extra. He didn't want her to feel bad about that. Don't rebuke her. She's going she's gonna to know that I'm telling you to be kind to her. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does not rebuke us because we know that He's being generous to us. He loves us. Because the more we understand about our salvation, the more we understand that we do not deserve it, the more we realize the grace we've been given, the more we understand that we deserve none of the grace that we've been given. Yet God does not rebuke us. He does not humiliate us for us. He loves us. He invites us to eat. See, uh, listen to Paul in Ephesians 2. He says, God who is rich in mercy because of His great love that He had for us, because of this great love that He had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might display... Listen the immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Throughout our lives, God keeps pulling those things out of that bundle and leaves them for us out of grace if we'll just listen, if we'll just pay attention. Out of His immeasurable riches of His grace through His kindness to us in Jesus Christ, we are as Ruth picking up the easy heads of grain. God wants us to share in His immeasurable riches. Is that not amazing? Is that not wonderful, the Savior that we serve? And we see this picture right here. It's right in front of us. Boaz and Ruth. Ruth coming into Boaz's protection. Boaz sharing out of what to her must have seemed like immeasurable riches so that she might live. And it's only beginning. It's only starting. Look at verses 19 through 23. Now remember, she's gone home. She's got, she's got all the barley and some leftover lunch, and she go is, goes into Naomi. And up to now, recall, Naomi's kind of been out of it. When Ruth said, hey, can I go glean 
you know, go off by myself. I'm a young foreign widow. Can I go out here by myself? And Naomi says, yeah, you, you, you go. Do whatever. Well, things are going to start clicking in place for Naomi. Listen to this. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you gather barley today, and where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who noticed you. Ruth told her mother-in-law, whom, she'd been working, who, whom she had worked with, and said, The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May the Lord bless him because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. Naomi continued, The man is a close relative. He, he's one of our family redeemers. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also told me, Stay with my young men until they finished all of my harvest. So Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, my daughter, it is good for you to work with his female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain until the barley and wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. Suddenly the light bulb goes on in Naomi's mind. This is not all happenstance. The Lord has led you to the very field of Boaz who you will recall from early in this chapter we are told is a relative of Elimelech. And why is that so important? Well, you know, we've talked about different aspects of the law that we see here. The law that allows uh, widows and orphans and sojourners to glean. We talked about the law prohibiting interaction with Moab. And here we see another element of the law that plays a great role in this story. And that is the law of the kinsman redeemer. Boaz is one, and that will cause a little bit of of drama here later on, but Boaz is one of Naomi's kinsman redeemers. Now, you say, what is a kinsman redeemer? Well, in the Mosaic Law, in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 25, it specifically talks about this situation. There's a whole suite of laws in the Mosaic Law having to do with preserving the land. You say, what do you mean, preserving the land? Well, when the nation of Israel came into the promised land, God was very specific with regard to where each element of land went, with which family, with which tribe. Okay, And it was very important for God that that family continue to own that land for as long as they possibly could. So he put some laws in place that would help it stay in the family. Listen to Leviticus 25, 25. If your brother becomes destitute and sells part of his property, his nearest relative may come and redeem what his brother has sold. There are other elements of the law having to do with, uh, with marriage and with widowhood that we'll get into next week. But for this, for, for, for what we're talking about today, Naomi's saying, look, you know, we had to sell out and go. And, and here's an opportunity for our kinsman redeemer to step in and redeem the land from where it has gone and bring it back into our family. Now, what does that have to do with us today? We have a kinsman redeemer in Jesus the Christ who has stepped into history and said, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to redeem Richard. I'm going to redeem, put your name in that blank. I'm going to step in and I'm going to redeem them from the world that they live in, from the world of evil, from the world of sin. All they have to do is call on my name. All they have to do is believe in faith that I can save them and I will do that. And Naomi sees this coming to fruition in the life of her and Ruth. Now, for us today, here's the key thing. It has to do with decisions, it has to do with discerning God's law, and it has to do with redemption. God provided a way for us to be redeemed. God provided a way for us to come into His fellowship. God provided a way for us to come under His protection, to have a relationship with Him, to sit at the 
marriage feast of the Lamb. He, had a way, he has provided a way for us to be a part of His immeasurable riches. And that is through a simple act of calling upon Jesus to save us from our sin. All we have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I'm going to turn from my evil ways, Lord. If you will help me, I'm going to place all of my faith and all of my trust in you. Dear Jesus, save me. And he'll do it. It's that simple. It's a matter of us acting in faith. And all of this story leads to this. We can't make that, we cannot do that. We cannot, we, we cannot receive Jesus into our life absent understanding who he is. And all we have to do is understand that he's willing to save us and place our faith and trust in him. He'll do that. And maybe today, maybe today that's the act. Maybe you're like Ruth. Maybe you're coming to realize your sin. She recognized she was a foreigner. Maybe you're recognizing that because of your sin, you're a foreigner to God. And you're saying, who am I, God, that you would do this? Know that he does it out of love. Maybe that's the first decision you need to make. Maybe there's other decisions you need to make. Maybe, maybe you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe today you need to, to call upon Jesus to to give you the strength to stand up in front of your friends and your neighbors and say, I'm following Jesus in believer's baptism. Maybe you need a place to call home. Maybe you don't belong to a church. Maybe you need to belong to a fellowship of believers like First Baptist. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's a broken relationship in your life. Whatever it is, don't let today slip by you. Ruth immediately recognized when God was dealing with her through Boaz. She recognized it immediately and she acted on it. She said, who am I? Boaz understood the greater matter of the law, which wasn't the prohibition of the Moab people, but to love his neighbor. Maybe through a broken relationship, you need to show love through your, to your neighbor. I don't know what it is this morning. I just ask you not to let this opportunity pass you by. Will you stand with me?